people of God. Good morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning. It's a joy to have a little break in the heat after the earlier part of the week. It's a joy to uh, celebrate a lot of different things together in one day. Today is Father's Day. It's also Juneteenth. We'll spend a little time um, speaking to each of those things, but mostly we're just going to focus on the ways in which God brings calm out of chaos, the ways in which God is present with us when it seems like the world is in madness. A few announcements before we dive into our time of worship today. The first is that we have an upcoming whimsical worship event. It's going to be every bit as fun and playful as it sounds. It's an opportunity for uh, sort of intergenerational gatherings, so people of all ages, um, as as the Christmas song says, from 2 to 92, but beyond those boundaries also. Um, It's a chance to come together and engage in some intentional, uh, playful sort of crafting activities and then a quick little worship service with a message and then a meal, a shared meal afterwards. So that's coming up on Tuesday, July 5th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in coming, please make sure you let Janine know. Um, She is our office manager and so keeps track of attendance for things like that, but also she's the one providing dinner that night and needs to know how many mouths to feed. So please make sure that if you do plan to join us for whimsical worship on Tuesday, July 5th, that you let Janine know that you'll be there. You can call the church office. Speaking of fun church-wide events, we have a date change to announce. This will be in your newsletter as well, um, but make sure that you get this because I've been drilling July 17th into your minds as the date of our church picnic um, in consultation with a handful of uh, sort of interested parties, shall we say. We decided to change the date so that we could get a better pavilion. So uh, what I had initially booked us in was Um, more of a rustic sort of tent than I had realized with kind of uneven ground that would be difficult for many to to navigate and and no electricity and all sorts of things like that that I just had not thought through because I'm not an adequate party planner. It is what it is. Um, But some some folks who are more detail-oriented than I am thank God, literally, uh, realized the error of my ways, and so we'll be changing the date so that we can get a fully enclosed pavilion uh, still at the state park. It has electricity. It's got a nice cement ground to it, so it'll be more comfortable for, for people to walk across, all that good stuff. So, Sunday, September 11th. Sunday, September 11th is the new date of the church picnic. July 17th will be here just like any other day. Sunday, September 11th will be at the Seneca Lake State Park for our church picnic. So make sure you change the date on your calendar. Now, if you're extra Johnny on the spot with your calendar, you might notice that we had set aside Sunday, September 11th as the date of the leadership town hall meeting. Because of the picnic date change, the Leadership Town Hall will now be changing dates to Sunday, October 2nd. Church picnic, Sunday, September 11th. Leadership Town Hall, Sunday, October 2nd. All of this will be in writing and newsletters and bulletins and all of that sort of thing. So if you don't have your calendar on you, that's okay. Um, But I just wanted to make sure you made note of those changes. Sunday, July 17th will be a very normal, typical Sunday here in the sanctuary. All right, I think that covers it. Again, today is both Father's Day and Juneteenth, and at different points in the service, we'll take a moment to, uh, to pay due recognition to each of those um, holidays that are happening concurrently today. Other than that, I think that's it for announcements. Nobody's raising their hand, jumping up, or hollering at me, so I think we're good. Let's take a breath, then. Let's center our hearts. And let's prepare to hear what God has to say to us this day.
Amen. Would you join me in our opening prayer? God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us in the midst of the storm. O still, small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world. We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. Would you stand as you're able to join in singing, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Amen. Please be seated. And let us join our voices together in a prayer of confession. We come seeking God in mighty earthquakes. We come listening for God in resounding thunder. We come expecting God in sweeping victories. Yet God is found in a baby's touch. Yet God speaks in silence. Yet God is found in the least of these. Save us, O God, from our aimless wandering. Save us, O God, from our idols. Save us, O God, from our self-induced chaos. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Hear the good news of God's love for us not in the earthquake, not in the storms, not in the mighty deeds, but in the silence, in the gentle touch, in the quiet rain, God says again, you are my beloved, I love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. The peace of Christ be with you.
right, I'm going to invite the children to come join me for a few minutes. We're going to talk about Father's Day, which is a tricky thing to talk about in church sometimes, but we're going to do it anyway. Oh, come on down, gentlemen. It's good to see you three again. It's been a couple weeks. Uh, I'm going to come around where I can see you, because it's weird having a conversation with people I can't see. <laughs> you guys enjoying your weekend with Grandma? She's pretty cool, isn't she? Yup. <laughs> Awesome. So today is two different holidays in one. Today is Father's Day, and it's also Juneteenth. Juneteenth is the reason why you have no school tomorrow. Woohoo! Um, we'll talk about that later in the service when it's prayer time. But for now, we're going to talk a little bit about Father's Day. Father's Day is a tricky one because it's not really a Jesus holiday. It's, it's not really something that started in church or has a lot to do with church. And so Talking about it in church can be a tricky business. But one of the things that's cool about church is that it puts us into a community. What do you think I mean by community? It's not, a, not really a churchy word. It's a word you hear other places, too. Teamwork. That's a great answer. Yeah. Community is where a group of people come together and work together and care for one another and care about one another, right? People in community help each other. Like, right now, some of my kids who are younger than you guys, I have one who's three, he's in preschool, he's learning about community helpers. And so community helpers, examples are like firefighters and police officers and people like that, right? In communities like this one, we have helpers too. We have people who sing in the choir. We have people who run the technology. We have people who greet you with a smile at each of the doors. We have all sorts of community helpers here. And so being a part of a community means that you have a lot of people here who will help you and teach you and support you, just like some dads do. Some fathers that we celebrate on Father's Day help and teach and support. So the cool thing about celebrating Father's Day in a church in particular is that you don't have to pick any one person to celebrate. You can celebrate all of the people in this community who teach, who support, who love, who help, who pray for you. And guess what? That's everyone in this room. So what we're going to do today is we're going to hand, hand out some Father's Day gifts. But rather than handing them out to just certain specific people, we're going to hand them out to everyone in the room. And everyone who gets one can make a decision about whether they want to give it to a special father in their life, whether they want to keep it for themselves, or whether they want to give it to someone else entirely. I won't see my dad today, but I will see my husband, and he's the father of my kids, so I might give one to him. But I might also give one to some other people who have had a positive influence on me. So today's Father's Gift is for anyone who's been a teacher, a supporter, a comforter, someone who's nurtured you, someone who's cared for you. And you can decide however you want to play that out. So we're going to pray in a minute. It's going to be a repeat after me prayer. And then the four of us, you three and me together, are going to walk around and we're going to hand out, we have those little bracelets for Father's Day presents, and we're going to make sure everyone in the room gets one, okay? All right, let's do a quick repeat after me prayer first. Dear God, Dear God thank you for fathers, thank you for fathers and, for and for people who act like fathers. Help us celebrate you, us celebrate the greatest father ever. And help us remember that we are part of a community of love and support. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, are you guys ready to give me a hand with this? Maybe Mrs. Gelati can offer some music while we hand these out.
Cal's going to offer our first scripture reading this morning. Our first reading this morning is 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 15a. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him, him being Jesus. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man 
and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man for whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear, so he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is a message from God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Well, my husband and I have a way of describing our home life with four young children and their myriad of needs by calling it our beautiful chaos. We are in constant chaos, and I love it. This is our beautiful chaos. Things can be crazy at home, just as they are in the world around us. In fact, it's a good day when we can end the day with the dishes and laundry caught up before midnight. (laughs) Usually that doesn't happen. When we travel somewhere, even if it's just a few hours at the beach, we pack a full duffel bag to accommodate everyone's needs. And and our color-coded Google Calendar often has so many overlapping components to it that we have to sit down every night after the kids go to sleep and have what we call staff meeting, which is really just a matter of figuring out who's going to drive who, where, and when, and how that all works out. And most of them are not even in after-school activities yet. Pray for me when they're teenagers. It's our beautiful chaos, and it's our daily life. Likewise, I find that these days it seems like our nation and our world is in some kind of state of chaos. I find myself particularly delighted when the news cycle is actually boring for a day. In fact, yesterday I opened my news app on my phone, I scrolled through the headlines, and I said to my husband, good news, President Biden fell off his bike. And my husband said, why is that good news? And I said, because he wasn't injured, and that's actually newsworthy today. The news is boring enough that that's actually newsworthy. That's good news. It seems like this world is in chaos. There are wars around the world. The pandemic is still bearing down on us. We're hearing more and more talk of things like bear markets and possible recessions. There's racism running rampant, sexism, gun violence ravaging our nation. A boring day in the news cycle is a great spiritual reprieve. Chaos is not just for us, though. We all, all humans in all of history, have our seasons of chaos or parts of our lives that feel like they're in constant chaos. Chaos is is a pretty universal human experience. So what, then, is the faithful response to this madness that seems to plague us. Today's scripture readings are really interesting, which is a nice way of saying they're really weird. First, we have a reading about a a sort of dramatic telling of this prophet um, who had murdered a bunch of other prophets and, and was fleeing from this king and his wife who wanted then to murder him. And, and then there were windstorms and caves and earthquakes and fire. And, and then we get to the gospel readings where there are demons and torment. Today's a weird day in the world of scripture readings. But these stories, dramatic as they may be, also have a common thread of stillness, healing, and a hearing of the voice of God. 
these scripture readings are also really interesting in the sense that they counter our pervasive notion that in order to find relief or healing or calm or stillness, that we must do something, accomplish something, reach some sort of spiritual goal point. If only I could get myself to sit quietly for five minutes a day. If only I could commit to that yoga practice that I've been meaning to start for the last 20 years. If only, if only I did or achieved, then I might find stillness. These scripture readings speak against that notion. In other words, they teach us that the movement from madness to stillness is not something we accomplish by our own power, but rather that it is the doing of God. The movement from madness to stillness, from chaos to calm, is really the doing of God. These stories echo the biblical truth that we come across in Exodus where it says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So let's, let's dig into these stories a bit more. In the first story, we hear about a conflict between a character named Ahab and a character named Elijah. And, and unless you're finding yourself immersed these days in the book of 1 Kings, which many of us are not, you might not know some of the background between these two characters. Ahab was generally regarded as the worst king ever. He was the king of Israel at a time in Israel's history, and he was just awful, evil in every way imaginable, completely working against the will of God at every possible opportunity, pretty much just the worst king ever. He was married to a woman named Jezebel, who wasn't a whole lot better. Jezebel very much sided with her husband in most matters, and so Queen Jezebel and King Ahab were like the antithesis of what God would want for God's people. Then there was this prophet named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God, so a man who heard messages from God and communicated them to God's people. And because Ahab and, and Jezebel were so antithetical to God, and Elijah's message was from God, you can imagine that Ahab and Elijah came to blows more than once. When we enter this story, we're coming right on the heels of a story where Elijah has gathered a bunch of Ahab's false prophets and murdered them all. Maybe took things a little too far in the doing. I don't condone murder, even if it is for people who are working against the will of God. But nevertheless, that's what happened. Elijah had gathered up a bunch of Ahab's false prophets and slaughtered them. And so Jezebel came from her king and husband to, a, to, to Elijah with a message that basically amounted to, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. That was, that was Jezebel's message to Elijah. So this story takes place when Elijah is fleeing for his life. He's in the middle of fleeing for his life. When he reaches the end of his rope, he just drops down in absolute and utter despair. There's nothing I can do anymore. I don't even want to try anymore. I'd rather just end it all. And God speaks to Elijah. This is the first time in this reading that we hear the voice of God. God speaks to Elijah and, and offers him bread that was baked on some nearby stones and some water to drink and then a place to lay his head down. In other words, God says, Elijah, I get it. What you really need is a nap and a snack. And that's what Elijah does. He gets some rest. He has some bread. He has some water. And he gets up a little while later, sometime later, ready to keep running, ready to keep fleeing, ready to keep seeking God and chasing away from Ahab. So then Elijah runs himself into a cave. And while he's in this cave, he's, he's promised that he will hear the voice of God. And so he's hanging out in this cave, 
after a good little snack and a good little nap, and he's waiting to hear the voice of God, and, and this wind comes through. Now, we've had some pretty intense storms this last week. It's not like that. This wind breaks mountains, according to Scripture. Doesn't tear limbs off of trees, but breaks mountains. So this is, this is not just a bad storm. This is a mighty, powerful, supernatural level of wind. This wind comes rushing through, and Elijah's thinking to himself, that's it, that's the voice of God, except that it's not. And then this earthquake comes. Imagine being inside a cave during an earthquake, right after mountains were broken by wind. This earthquake comes, and Elijah's thinking to himself, surely that's the voice of God, and it's not. And then there's a fire. Now, fire makes a lot of sense, because Elijah knows that back in the day when the Israelites left captivity in Egypt and Moses led them to freedom, God was with them always in the form of a pillar of fire. And that even before that, God appeared to Moses as a burning bush that didn't burn up. So God has already been present in fire a few times before. So surely, Elijah's thinking, this fire, this is where I hear God's voice, and it's not. So now Elijah's just kind of thinking, all right, what up, God? Where where are you? You're not in the wind. You're not in the earthquake. You're not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Elijah pokes his head out of the cave and kind of sees what's going on. And then the voice of God comes to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answers, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. Elijah recognizes that this is the voice of God. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant. I am alone. They are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord tells Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Not in the chaos of fleeing from mortal danger. Not in the energy of the wind or the earthquake or the fire. Not in any of the loud and chaotic ways. But in the stillness afterwards, does Elijah hear God's voice. God's voice that feeds protects, offers nourishment and rest, and guides him, tells him where to go along his way. Then we get to the gospel reading. So we're going we're gonna to set aside our um, slaughter of false prophets and our earthquakes and wind and fire, and we're going to step now into a man plagued by a myriad of demons that are inside of him. And and this is an equally odd story, if not even more so. This man is described as living his life completely unclothed and sleeping in tombs. So so we've got a, a naked dude running around a cemetery making his home there, basically. So already this is a really odd story again. And, and the scripture is no holds barred in telling us just how tormented this individual is. The, the gospel writer Luke, who loves attention to detail, he was a doctor, by the way, the gospel writer Luke, who loves attention to detail, makes sure to tell us that he was unclothed and living in tombs and that people would try to, to chain him for his own safety, I guess, but that he would actually break the chains that they used on him. Generally speaking, he was terrifying and tormented by the demons within. Jesus enters the scene and has a conversation not just with the man, but with the demons inside of him. Jesus has this conversation, and just by the power of his words, by the power of his voice, these demons are sent out of the man. Now, a couple things that are really incredible about this story. One is that Jesus doesn't actually tell the demons to go away early on in the story. The the demons recognize 
that, that Jesus is who he is. And the demons start the conversation by saying, please don't send us into the abyss. Can we go into those pigs instead? And, and Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, okay. And knowing, of course, what's going to happen at that point. But, but what's remarkable to me is that there's no sort of megaphone moment where Jesus says to the demons, get thee gone, get thee out of this man. They already know that Jesus is here, and so they're not. They're goners. The second thing about this story that's really remarkable to me is the stark contrast in the man's behavior. Luke goes to great lengths to explain to us just how far gone this man is. And then in verse 35, after the demons left the man, Luke writes, Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. From madness to stillness, in a moment by the power of God. Jesus didn't require anything of this man. He, he didn't need to do anything in service to God as a way of earning the healing that he received. He need only to be in the presence of Jesus. And of course it would be that way. In the presence of God, the universe has moved from madness to stillness, from chaos to calm, literally since the dawning of creation. When the world was first formed, God hovered over all that was, and it was a formless void. It was pure chaos, and the voice of God spoke, and order started to come about from that chaos. And of course, Jesus, the, the Son of God, God in human form, would have that same power as well, not just over demons, but over all forces of the natural world. Jesus, who, who was sleeping in a boat when a storm came in that would kill him and his, his colleagues, and, and all he had to do was wake up, speak the words, be still and the storm would subside. Even the wind and waves obey the voice of God. Of course it would be this way, that Elijah would come to God in, in pure chaos and madness and despair and confusion and find food and water and rest and protection. Of course it would be that this man tormented by the demons within would come to God and sit at Jesus' feet, and find healing and peace for his soul. Beloved, we all have areas in our lives or seasons in our lives that feel like madness. There are days when it feels like our spirit will not rest. But God calls us to do just that. If today is a day like that for you, go home after church and grab a snack, take a nap, and then see how you hear God's voice after that. Know that God brings about stillness. Like the man in the gospel reading, know that Jesus is able to heal you simply by being with you. Trust that God is with you, that God loves you, and that God has br been bringing stillness out of madness and calm out of chaos since the dawning of creation. God is with you. God loves you, and peace will come. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as you're able to join in singing God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale?
Amen. Please be seated. As we move into our time of sharing our joys and concerns with one another, a few concerns that I'll lift up, and then I have a little something to read to you about Juneteenth, um, which I'll speak to in a moment. Uh, first, we've been asked to pray for Peyton, who had a medical concern earlier in the week. I got to see him, and he's on the upswing now, um, or at least was when I saw him a couple days ago. I brought him a packet of 50 jokes. So next time you see Peyton, if he asks you what you get when you cross a snail with a porcupine, the answer is a slowpoke. So... Continued prayers for Peyton as he heals and as the doctors work to discern what his needs are. We're also asked to pray for the family of Bob Slattery, who passed recently. And I just want to shift our attention as we prepare to join in prayer to Juneteenth for a moment. Um, we have a big banner out in front of our building that says, Pray with us for racial justice. And so I just want to read to you a little bit about Juneteenth. I didn't know a whole lot about it. And so I went online and found the proclamation of uh, on Juneteenth. Tenth day of observance, 2022. I won't read the whole thing, but I, I want to read a few paragraphs, and then we are going to do just that. We are going to pray for racial justice. This says, after the Union Army captured New Orleans in 1862, slave owners in Confederate states migrated to Texas with more than 150,000 enslaved black persons. For three years, even after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved black Americans in Texas remained in brutal bondage, immorally and illegally deprived of their freedom and basic dignity. On June 19, 1865, over two years after President Lincoln declared all enslaved persons free, Major General Gordon Granger and Union Army troops marched to Galveston, Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation and free the last enslaved black Americans in Texas. Skipping ahead a little, uh, in the Juneteenth Proclamation, we read, this Juneteenth, we are freshly reminded that the poisonous ideology of racism has not yet been defeated. It only hides. Our nation continues to mourn the 10 lives senselessly taken in Buffalo, New York, and grieve for the families who have lost a piece of their soul. As we confront the awful reality of yet another gunman massacring innocent people in the name of hatred, racism, and fear, we must meet this moment with renewed resolve. We must stand together against white supremacy and show that bigotry and hate have no safe harbor in America. Juneteenth is a day to reflect on both bondage and freedom, a day of both pain and purpose. It is an equal member, a remembrance of both the long, hard night of slavery and subjugation, as well as a celebration of the promise of a brighter morning to come. On Juneteenth, we remember our extraordinary capacity to heal, to hope, and to emerge from our worst moments as a stronger, freer, and more just nation. It is also a day to celebrate the power and resilience of black Americans who have endured generations of oppression in the ongoing journey toward equal justice, equal dignity, equal rights, and equal opportunity in America. And if you'd like to read the whole proclamation for, for yourself, you can find it at whitehouse.gov. I can email it out as well. Today we're going to pray for racial justice during our time of prayer now. So let's bow our heads together. Dear God, we pray that you will stir in our hearts, that you will fill us with boldness and compassion courage to speak out wherever harm is caused, resilience to stand strong in the face of that which you despise. We pray that you would fill us with that fierce love that a parent has for their child, that we might 
be protectors and providers, that we might be freers from oppression, that we might work fervently this day and every day to rid our nation, our churches, and our spirits of all that is not of you. We give you thanks for the fact that the arc of history bends towards justice. We give you thanks for the fact that you are with us and have not left us. We give you thanks for the fact that you will continue to be with us, forgiving us for our complacency and our complicity, and freeing us again and again to do your work in the world. We pray that your work might be done in this world, O oh God, that all who are ill or injured would know healing. That all who are living in fear would know peace. That those who are subject to violence would have protection. that those who are grieving would be surrounded in a mantle of comfort. That those who are oppressed, imprisoned, addicted, afflicted would be made free, totally free, completely free to serve you, to praise you, to speak to the joy that is found in your power. We pray a prayer of praise, O God, for we recognize your power. We recognize your power to free and to heal, to comfort and protect, to provide for all in their time of need. We thank you for providing for us for providing this community of love and support, for providing the presence of your spirit, stirring within us this day and every day. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all that you are, for all that you do, and for all that you call us to be. In all of these things, we recognize that you are love and that our work is love. May it be that we love you, O oh God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we truly come to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And now let us live into our words of prayer by giving back to God a bit of that which God has given to us.
let's remain standing as we speak the Lord's Prayer together and then sing our closing hymn through it all. Would you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Please be seated to receive these words of blessing and the blessing of the music that follows. This is called Blessing in the Chaos, and it's by Jan Richardson. To all that is chaotic in you, let there come silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that have laid their claim on you that have made their home in you, that go with you even to the holy places, but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or feel the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans and let depart all that keeps you in its cage. Let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos, where you find the peace you did not think possible, and see what shimmers within the storm. Amen. <laughs> 